over here and um, and then I should be checking my settings to make sure that everything is working. Let me just test the, um, the microphone. It's built in um, and it's not using Logitech, which means that I took it out. Let me just test the, um, the microphone. It's built in um, and it's not using Logitech, which means Whoops. Hello, testing. All right. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, this is Nellie Deutsch. I hope you can see me um, and hear me. Welcome. Welcome hello, to... Testing. Today's All right. session. Um, hello, everyone. Uh, this is Nellie Deutsch. I hope you can see me um, and hear me. Welcome. Looks like I'm in twice. Okay, I think it's working uh, just fine. Just let me know in the chat box if you can hear me while we're waiting for others to come in. If you can uh, tell us where you're from and uh, where you are this morning. And if this is your first time on WizIQ, that should be interesting. Okay, you hear me. Great, because I, for some reason I heard myself twice. All right, so we've got Judy. Hi, Judy. Welcome. And we've got Eric and Guadalupe. Nice to see you. And Bernardo. Okay, so um, we've got Eric from Virginia Beach. Lovely. Lovely place. Uh, I was there in October and I wanted to stay there forever. So I envy you for living in such a beautiful place. Is this your first time on WizIQ? Just let me know so that I get an idea. It's spring. That's great. I'm glad it's spring uh, in Virginia Beach and the flowers. It must be beautiful. Wish I were there. And we've got Tatiana, is that correct, from Russia? You know, it comes out in um, Russian script, so I'm not really sure. All right, today's uh, session is really, really important for me and uh, in how uh, I operate these days because it's really about uh, teachers. So I put a poll out just to get an idea. We've got a, let's see what the results are even though there are only nine people here, eight votes. Um, the question, are you a great teacher? And we've got half, half. Don't know and no. So you must be very modest. And one person who says yes. All right, so I'll leave that for the rest as they come in so we get uh, more polling here. All right, that's something to think about. Are you a great teacher? Well, do you teach to learn or do you learn to teach? Uh, which or is it both? Okay, we're going to be doing a few things um, today. First of all, we're going to take a look and explore what learning is for each one of us. What is effective learning? what the system dictates. And when I say system, I mean the school boards, the schools, the government, and so on. The teacher's role in all of this, effective teaching and what it happens to be, and finally measuring effective teachers. And notice there's a question mark on most of them except for effective teaching. But that's also uh, a question. So we're going to be exploring. If you came here to get content, uh, you're in the wrong place because when it comes to learning, we don't really know. But we have some pretty good ideas. Okay, I'm um, following a lot of uh, philosophers and um, 
this has been a question for many, many years, and we're still exploring it. So um, what is learning for you? Okay, if you can just add it in the chat box and share your thoughts on learning. You could put one word, two words. Um, you don't have to write sentences just to get uh, a sense of what it is. For me, learning is uh, something that happens 24-7. Uh, I think it's ongoing. It never stops until we stop. So let's see, ongoing. Oh, I see somebody else is also writing that uh, ongoing. That's great. Our own learning, we're great teachers. Yes, we are. Everyone's a great teacher to someone, some of the time, most of the time. Um, ongoing. Okay, so for me too, lifelong journey. All right, so I see that we're, most of us are on the pa same page when it comes to learning, and that's good. And I think this is key. When we talk about teacher effectiveness, are we talking about learning? Are we talking about teachers as what? Okay, that's the question. When we talk about teacher effectiveness, what are we talking about? Are we all talking about the same thing or are we talking about different things? Okay, that's the question that um, we're going to explore today. Okay, effective for whom, under what conditions, for what? And is learning part of it? Okay, thank you, Ermeli. Learning equals listening. Learning is a special situation. Teacher is always a learner. <laughs> That's right. Who isn't? Is anyone in this world not a learner? I mean, I hope we're all blessed with this and that we're all capable of learning. Effective meaning, it must create a change in the learner. Yep, so learning is actually changing from one from X to Y? Is it about content? So what is learning? Okay, that's key. I think before we talk about anything, we have to decide what learning is or else what are teachers there for? Well, I'm going to bring up Martin Heidegger and I've got his book right here. I um, I have been uh, following uh, Martin Heidegger for many, many years. I know that politically there are bad things about him, and um, but putting politics aside and a person's way of life and just his ideas, if we can do that, then uh, Heidegger's got some great ideas about teaching. According to Heidegger, teaching is really difficult because it... Um, forces teachers or allows teachers, whether it's a privilege, uh, a blessing, but it means that teachers let students learn. So letting someone else learn is teaching. And you can think of uh, your children, if you've got children or grandchildren or uh, relatives, letting them learn. The real teacher, in fact, lets nothing else be learned than learning. So actually, teachers are focused on learning, according to Martin Heidegger. Okay. You can. My slides are available for uh, downloading and playing around with. You can also uh, change them, do whatever you wish with them. I'll give you the link to where they appear. Um, in fact, this uh, recording is also going to be on YouTube, and that's also the recording will be downloadable there so that you can do whatever you want with it. Okay, so um, everything that I put up is generally 
available and it follows CC Creative Commons. So uh, here is the link and you can do as you wish with it as long as you give me credit which would be nice. Next is Carl Rogers. Carl Rogers wrote a great book called Freedom to Learn and he follows Martin Heidegger when he says that the task of a teacher is to permit the student to learn, to feed his or her own curiosity. And facts are only something that happens as a result, but that's not what should lead. Okay, facts are not the important thing. The important thing is the experience and the process. So again, what is effective learning? Now that you thought about learning, what is effective learning? Okay, if you could add that in the chat. Every answer is correct because it's your thoughts. It's what you think. Learning is a special. Okay, let's see. I'm waiting. Okay, so don't think too much. Whatever comes to mind. Effective means that um, it sticks. It works. It's a hard question, but we're asking what is an effective teacher, what is an effective learner, so what is effective learning? Okay, that's where we get stuck. Okay, so effective learning is when learning outcomes are achieved. Again, okay, what are those learning outcomes? Who sets them up? Who is in charge of what I learn? Okay, is it my responsibility? Do I choose what to learn? Does someone dictate it for me? Okay, these are questions that we need to consider when we talk about teacher effectiveness. What is useful for me? Very good, Guadalupe. Exactly. What can lead me to the next step if we want to change, if learning is changing? then what is going to take me where I want to go? Okay, all right. Now, you've all heard about uh, Bill Gates and other people such as Bill Gates. Bill Gates just represents uh, someone who dropped out of school because he couldn't manage the school system. And uh, he's the expert on teacher effectiveness, on learning, um, and he's got the money to try out different things. And the way he speaks about teachers, you'd think that teachers were factory workers or uh, people who needed to be uh, fixed. And I don't mean that as a joke, I mean that seriously. He feels that teachers need to be fixed. But Ken Robinson, who's an educator, has wonderful things to say about teachers. And he talks about the art of teaching. And I'd like to share that with you because it's wonderful to hear someone. And I'm not sure which video this is, so bear with me. I hope I've got the right one. It's a YouTube video. Yeah, this is the one. Let me know if you can hear. Education is a personal process. It's people who learn. It's a human mind, a human heart that is responding to their own experiences. Great teachers know that. They know that the way you get people to learn is by connecting it to the learner's interest, to what motivates them, what energizes them, what excites them, what engages their imagination. Technology in its many forms now offers unknown and untold opportunities to engage young people's imaginations and to uh, provide forms of teaching and learning which are highly customized to them. Real heart of teaching is an art form, I believe, because great teachers 
also look into the eyes of their students and recognize who they are and how well they're responding and whether this is something they could take further or not. Teachers have a, a really important role as mentors as well as people who are there to engage students in a standard curriculum of any sort. At the heart of all great professions is a, a deep power of connoisseurship. It's true of great musicians, it's true of all virtuosi, that they know what's appropriate here and now. And great teachers are like that. They have a, a repertory of skills and possibilities and knowledge, but their skill is to apply it here and now with you, to know what would be appropriate. So I believe it's both personally essential that we have forms of education which are humane and balanced and liberal and sensitive and tolerant, but I believe it's a global imperative at the same time. And that the stakes we're playing for are very high and we can't afford to get it wrong. Okay, I hope you were able to uh, hear that. Um, I wrote some of the things that he said. Notice what he said here. Okay, I hope you can see that it's not too small on your computer. But um, he talked about learning. Here, let's see if I can maybe... Uh, learning is something personal. It's people. <laughs> it's not machines. It's people who learn. And... Um, what teachers do best is they respond to uh, each of their students' own experience and they try to find what the learner's interest is. It's a human process and teachers know it and teachers customize it. Great teachers look at the eyes of their students. Teachers are mentors. They know what is appropriate here and now and Guadalupe mentioned it it's learning here and now and if you're teachers you know it when you walk into a classroom and you look at your students in the eyes you know what you're going to do and you know that you're going to approach your students by looking at them and relating to them you're not going to go through a syllabus you're not going to go through what you planned for that day if your students are tired or worried or whatever. You're going to relate to what they need at the moment and I think that is so important and that cannot be uh, measured with a camera each time, okay, because um, it's an art and you don't measure art, you don't measure people's feelings and that's where Bill Gates and a lot of people are wrong. Okay, the top down needs to learn from the bottom up. Teachers and students know what they want and what they need. So what do students want? Carl Rogers did a study in the early 90s and he, he went through the United States. He interviewed students and he asked them, what do you want? He asked students from the K-12 in higher education because he wanted to know. And this is what they told him. They want to be trusted. They want to be respected. They want to feel that school and the classroom is part of a family. They want teachers to be their helpers. They want to feel opportunities and they want to be responsible. Give us opportunities to be responsible. They want freedom to learn and not a license. They don't need a report card. They don't need degrees. They just want to learn. Teachers they want teachers to help them succeed, not fail. And sometimes students misunderstand teachers who are pressured by their administration to make sure that the student passes an exam no matter what. And then teachers are misunderstood because they are forced to teach to the test and students do not want to learn to the test. They want to learn because they love learning. And they want to have choices and not be forced and coerced 
to do things they don't want to do. And these are things that we should think about. But what does the system dictate? What do governments around the world, what do politicians, what do great men like Bill Gates dictate and force the system by paying millions of dollars? Okay, so what does the system dictate? If you can add that in the chat box. If you're a teacher or a student, you may have the answer if you're a student. If you're a teacher, I'm sure you know the answer, whether you teach in the K-12 or whether you teach um, in higher education, privately. Oh, is it getting choppy? You may want to, um, I see my, my bar is going very high. You may want to refresh the page or check to make sure that you're using the right device settings if you're... Um, Audio doesn't sound right. Okay. Standards. That's right, Judy. Standards. Standards for what? Okay. What are we doing? Are we, uh, is school like a factory? Are we producing garments? clothes that have to have certain standards okay we have standards for different things like standards for uh, appliances electrical appliances standards for cars we have standards for kids imagine standards for kids okay when you think about it it's really absurd because if school is about learning where do standards and who sets them up and why? Okay, the testing system, that's what it's about. And the question is, why? And here is Bill Gates. Bill Gates believes that if we put cameras in the classroom, teachers will be able to view those recordings of how they teach Others will be able to view the recordings, and then someone will tell the teachers how to improve their performance. Based on what? We're going, you know, when you talk about athletes, you know that a runner, a hundred dash runner, needs to run fast from X to Z. But where are we taking the kids? What performance? What do we want the kids to be able to do? What do we want the kids to do? Why cameras? What are we trying to get there? Athletes? Bionic people? Uh, if you're interested, there's a great article. I'm not sure whether um, I'm able to screen share. I wish I was. I'll try anyways, but here is the link. Let's see if it works. <laughs> sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. But let's see if um, I'm going to get the screen sharing. You probably can't hear me because I think it's it froze the system. <sighs> yeah, it froze the system. All right, let's see what happens. I think it's going to work. All right, it froze the system there for a little while. Um, let's see, don't block. It keeps asking me not to block, to block. Okay, I think I'm screen sharing now. I hope I'm screen sharing. Uh, let me take you, at least it'll come out in the recording. Um, this is Bill Gates wants cameras in the classroom. This is by Anya Kemenitz, okay? He says we need a system that helps all our teachers be as good as the best. One size fits all. Every teacher will teach the same way or similarly so that the students can do what? Actors do it. Professional athletes do it. Now Bill Gates wants America to spend $5 million, billion 
to overhaul the evaluation system for every teacher in every classroom in every district, including filming them in action. He's got the money. He can dictate. The new system would include videotaped lessons, classroom observations by trained observers. Who are these trained observers? I'd like to know. Who's the expert teacher? Who knows it all? Student satisfaction surveys and value-added calculations based on test scores. This is the key. You need to teach to the test. If you can teach the test and your students pass, you are a great teacher, according to Bill Gates. But don't forget that Bill Gates quit school. Among all his foundation's educational initiatives for things like smaller schools and new technology, Gates has increased zeroed on effective teaching as the key to improving education. And now to the questions. How do you know effective teaching when you see it? Judging teachers by their students' test scores alone is crude and incomplete. I'm sure all of you would agree. And I think that's the key. And let me just uh, bring that back to you. I'm going to stop sharing and add that to the chat. There we go. All right, so that is what Anya says. How do we know? How do we know? Okay, so test scores. Test scores on what? Bill Gates failed. He left school because he didn't like the exams, and now he wants to bring them back. Okay, very ironic. Test scores, ratings, everything that's measurable makes an effective teacher. How many of you agree? Ratings. It's all about ratings. Is that what we're talking about? Getting the highest scores. That means that if you get high scores, the teacher has achieved their goal. The country is now smart. Okay, because students got high scores. But who's setting up the exams? And who says that this is an indication of anything? Most dropouts, like Bill Gates, who didn't pass their tests, or Job, who wanted to learn but without taking the test, did just fine. Okay, so again, as I said, this is a bit ironic. Well, this is my response to Bill Gates. Measuring teacher effectiveness by adding video cameras in the classroom and observing teachers. And what I'm asking is this. Is testing effective? Why do we need to test? It seems that testing is effective for quality control. But of what and of whom? Professional athletes need to improve their physical performance and get the highest scores they can to be able to compete and win championships. But what championships are students going to win? But is that what we want from school children? Do we want our children to turn into machines, bionic machines, so they can improve their test scores? Is school and education about performing better on tests? Well, according to Bill Gates, yes. That's exactly what school is. Let's listen. Oh, sorry, that's not the one. I am that is another one. Here's Bill How Gates. How do you make a teacher great? Now, it seems like the kind of question that people would spend a lot of time on and that we'd understand very well. And the answer is, really? that we don't. Let's start with why this is important. Well, all of us here, I'll bet, had some great teachers. Uh, we all had a wonderful education. That's part of the reason we're here today, part of the reason we're successful. Uh, I can say that, even though I'm a college dropout. Uh, I had great teachers. And in fact, in the United States, the teaching system has worked fairly well. There are fairly effective teachers 
in a narrow uh, set of places. So the top 20% of students have gotten a good education. And those top 20% have been the best in the world, if you measure them against the other top 20%. And they've gone on to create the revolutions in software and, and biotechnology and keep the U.S. at the forefront. Now, the strength for those top 20% is starting to fade on a relative basis. But even more concerning is the education that the balance of people are getting. Uh, not only has that been weak, it's getting weaker. And if you look at the economy, it really is only providing opportunities now to people with a better education. And so we have to change this. We have to change it so that people have equal opportunity. We have to change it so that the country is strong and, and, and stays in the forefront of things that are, are driven by advanced education like science and mathematics. When I first learned the statistics, I was pretty stunned at how bad things are. Over 30% of kids never finish high school. And that had been covered up for a long time because they always took the dropout rate as the number who started in senior year and, and then compared it to the number that finished senior year because they weren't tracking where the kids were before that. But most of the dropouts had taken place before that. And so they had to raise the state of dropout rate as soon as that tracking was done to over 30%. For minority kids, it's over 50%. And even if you graduate from high school, if you're low income, you have less than a 25% chance of ever completing a college degree. If you're low income in the United States, you have a higher chance of going to jail than you do of getting a four-year degree. And that you know, doesn't seem entirely fair. Okay, I'm going to stop now and go on to the next one, but I think you get the feel of what the man is saying. And it's not very convincing from someone who got so far because he dropped out. Now, there are a few places, very few, where great teachers are being made. A uh, good example of one is... Notice he says... Great teachers are being made. Being made. He's talking about teaching and teachers as if they are machines, computers, objects. They're not people. He's speaking differently than Ken Robbins. Notice how he speaks. A set of charter schools called KIPP. KIPP means knowledge is power. It's an unbelievable thing. They have 66 schools, mostly middle schools, seven high schools, and uh, what goes on is great teaching. They take the poorest kids, and over 96% of their high school graduates go to four-year colleges. And the whole spirit and attitude in those schools is very different than in the normal public school. They're team teaching. They're constantly improving their teachers. They're taking data, the test scores, and saying to a teacher, hey, you caused this amount of increase. And so they're deeply engaged in making teaching better. When you actually go and, and sit in one of these classrooms, at first it's very bizarre. I sat down and I thought, what is going on? The teacher was running around and the ener energy level is high. I thought, well, I'm in the, prep, the, the sports rally or something. What's going on? And the teacher was constantly scanning to see which kids were I think that's the point. The point here is that it's like a rally, a sports rally. Is that what learning is about? Is learning about a sports rally? Is it about teachers running around forcing the kids to pass tests? Because that's what it's about. It's about teaching teachers forcing kids to take the test. So if I ask you, what makes a great teacher? And think back to your teachers. Think of the teachers that you had. And which one would you call great? And I'm going to start because this is one of the questions that we ask. One of my great teachers was called Miss Campbell. I don't even know if she ever got married. Miss Campbell was a great teacher because she was very strict. 
She was strict. She had crazy rules. She was my art teacher in grade 9 and 10. And she had crazy rules that worked. And I loved her because she was strict. Isn't that strange? And we've got Maria here, the ones that made me think and motivated me. All right. So when you think of great teachers, you know, what qualities did they have? Now, Miss Campbell was strict with everybody, but I got close to her and she was very, very caring. In fact, we corresponded for years after I finished high school. We became friends. So, so much for a strict teacher who became a very, very close friend later on. So, what is the teacher's role in school? And I think Maria is saying here, open, a teacher's role is to be open, to be motivating, encouraging, demanding. <laughs> That's very good, Maria. Is that the teacher's role? Is the teacher's role, according to uh, Bill Gates, to um, make sure that the kids are passing exams? guide. Okay, we see no, because real teachers will never tell you that that's the role of a teacher. It's only those who are not teachers, those on the side that seem to think that the teacher's role is to make sure that the kids pass their exams. School is not about exams. Oh, is the audio poor? Uh, you may want to refresh your page because I'm looking at my audio and uh, the bar is going... Uh, really well. It's going very high. So maybe Bern Bernardo, maybe you'd like to uh, refresh the page. That sometimes helps. Or make sure that you're using the right. And be reflective. That's right. And get the students to reflect as well. So the teacher is a human being. Remember what Ken Robbins says, um, Robinson? It's actually the teacher is a human being. Is the teacher's role to te teach to the test? Let's find out from Christine McCart what she has to say about teachers. And I love this. It is truly inspirational. I am your child's teacher. My role as educator extends far beyond the walls of my classroom. It's my profession, what I practice. I have chosen to devote the better part of what will be the years that make up my life to educating your child. I take it very seriously, and I should. I am a stakeholder in your child's future. And so are you. You take it seriously also. You take your role in your child's life more seriously than probably anyone else ever will. You've spent countless hours modeling empathy and kindness teaching right from wrong, helping your child learn how to navigate through an increasingly complicated world, and spending time to understand who your child is and where he or she is coming from. You do this in order to help guide your child down the path to who he or she will become. So I ask you, taking all of this into consideration, how willing would you be to allow some other parent to take over this role for you? Someone who claimed to know better than you, about what was right for your child. Think about it. Because that is what is happening in my classroom. And it isn't because they know better than I do how to educate your child. The undertaking I've chosen to devote my life's work to becoming better at. It certainly isn't because they've spent months getting to know the individual you have raised in an effort to better understand what your student needs to thrive in a responsive learning environment. It has nothing to do with the relationship they formed with your child in order to show respect and care for him or her as a person and a learner. It doesn't, for a second, reflect the passion I have for the subject I teach, passion that I pass on to your student in every way I can and at every chance I get. It simply has to do with money. It has to do with the $500 billion allocated by the United States government to children like yours. Your money. 
taxpayer money intended to directly benefit students, money that is being hijacked by for-profit educational management companies, the same people who are using their voices to belittle me and my colleagues and our schools and your child's performance in order to rationalize their hidden agenda, making money. They're spending their own money too. They're using it to pay lobbyists who help manipulate educational policy and dictate allocation of resources towards private companies. And it's working. The $13 million they had their hands on in 2005 has already risen to $389 million by 2011. Don't mistake it. There exists big profit potential in your child. $389 million. And that was two years ago. The person your child is and how he or she learns and grows cannot be gauged by an answer bubbled onto a sheet of paper. Your student deserves my full expertise, not a narrowed curriculum and hours devoted to my teaching to the test. My colleagues and I deserve to be freed from the negative impact that the calculated teacher bashing and union bashing is having on our profession, because it is calculated. And by this point, I don't think I need to tell you by whom. So please, educate yourself. Have a voice in this issue. Talk to teachers and administrators about what is happening in your child's school as a result of America's education reform. Support teachers you know are there for your students. Question media reports that claim there's a simple answer to so-called underperformance. And be aware of what is happening on a local and national level. It is affecting your students. And it isn't going away anytime soon. Every time I, um, I listen to that, I, I get emotional. It makes me want to cry. You know, it really is how politicians and the administration, not only in the United States, around the world, is using kids to make money. Testing is ruining the education system. She's made some wonderful points, Eric. I totally agree. And this is a young teacher. Uh, the video, for those of you that are interested, is also on the PowerPoint presentation. In other words, the PowerPoint presentation has active links, but here it is also. When you watch the recording, you'll be able to click on the whiteboard and you'll be taken to the um, places. In this case, uh, it'll be YouTube video to be able to watch the video. So when you view the recording, don't forget to click on the whiteboard so that you can be taken to the different links. Yeah, it's very sad, Deep T. Very, very sad. But it's the truth. That's what's even sadder. It's not a story. So what is effective teaching? If we don't know or we're not in agreement as to what learning is, and if it's all about testing, what can effective teaching be, but exactly what Bill Gates wants it to be, a performance, to raise the bar so that everybody passes exams. What these exams will do for the future of our kids, I have no idea, because if they memorize information that is useless in later life, It'll make them conformist. They'll conform to the system. We're going back 300 years to the factory where kids sit in class and regurgitate and conform to the system. It'll force teachers to conform to the system. So what's going to be the future of education when we all have to follow the rules of the game or get fired? Teachers are going to get fired. 
unless they conform and teach to the test because that's what the government and the administration decided and they're the ones that dictate what will be well this is Doris Day I don't know how many of you are familiar with Doris Day uh, one of her famous songs is um, que sera sera whatever will be will be the future is not ours to see que sera sera okay that's the song and I think it's really appropriate that here she is by the board and the song what will be will be so what makes an effective teacher the word makes is very very ironic because you don't make people Bill Gates you don't make great teachers Bill's question is how do you make a teacher great can you make thank you Marie in case Sarasara can you make a teacher great is it in our power does Bill Gates have the power he has the money but does he have the power does anybody have the power to make a great teacher and if you listen to the video by Bill Gates he says he compares teachers to factory workers and he says that factory workers need to be watched to make sure that they're doing the job right otherwise they'll fool around and they'll make mistakes so I'm asking Bill Gates when you compare teachers to factory workers are you suggesting the kids are objects that need quality control so that they do not come out defective because that's how he's treating us he's telling saying the teachers need to be checked at all times to make sure that they're not going down and that the kids that they're producing are not going to be defective and that's the point what are we measuring and Eric says the measures drive what we do in the class when we need to focus on the higher order thinking skills he doesn't say that but I'm sure that's what you had in mind exactly <laughs> exactly and, and I'm surprised that Bill Gates of all people a college dropout would be the one leading the campaign that's right it's called HOTS higher order even my students know about HOTS about the higher order thinking skills because I don't teach to the test well they pass the test but I don't specifically teach to the test I teach English and um, and everything else in between you know they learn about technology they learn about teamwork they learn about everything under the Sun and not only do they learn they teach me I learn with the kids and that's what it's all about so how do you measure effective teachers and someone asked me how do you measure effective students what's an effective learner which is also a ridiculous question because how do you measure effective teachers yes Bloom had the idea but I think Bloom was misunderstood because I think he was just used in the wrong way So how do we measure? Well, there are two articles that I'd like to share with you before um, we talk about Bill Gates' $45 million to find out what makes a school teacher effective. With the cameras, Bill had teachers place cameras in their classrooms so that he can find out. There's an article on video cameras to measure performance. I mean, video cameras have been used for years. I've been teaching for over 30 years. And there was some before the internet, there was something called micro teaching. How many of you are familiar with micro teaching? That was a way for teachers to learn to teach. You would teach, you would be televised, micro teaching, and then everybody would discuss how you can improve. But it was delivery of content. It was content delivery. That was good teaching in my day. <laughs> in my day, if you could deliver content nicely, um, you know, 
it had nothing to do with whether somebody could take a test and pass it. But if, if you were a good presenter, then you would make a good teacher <laughs> kind of thing. Yeah, the skills of teaching. Well, there's an article uh, called What Do Teachers Think and Feel When Analyzing Videos of Themselves and Other Teachers? This study was conducted in uh, 2013, a couple of months ago. It's a great article. You'll be able to get the PowerPoint presentation and um, look at this. You can find it in most libraries, online libraries, university libraries. And what they talk about is the reflective process. What is the value in observing other teachers' videos? What happens to a teacher who has a video camera in his or her class and the teacher watches her performance afterwards? Someone else watches it. What happens? How does a teacher feel? Well, if the teacher is going to observe him or herself, it's fine. But if someone else is going to observe the teacher and reprimand the teacher, that doesn't feel good. Okay? It may lead to emotional and lack of motivation on the part of the teacher. Nobody wants to be under the magnifying glass. But, according to the study, teachers do like to analyze their own videos because that's the only way they can learn. And Erica, it depends on the use, as you suggest. Is it formative or summative? I'm talking about formative. I don't understand why we need summative. Okay, uh, and I've been teaching for many years and I still don't understand it. Okay. Um, so you might want to take a look at that. They also talk about the future. In the future, it might be a good idea to have teamwork where everyone tries to uh, engage in video sharing and trying to learn from one another. For example, if I have a good idea, you can take it if you like it, but it's not a test. Nobody wants to be tested. If I ask you, how many of you want to be tested? How many of you like to be tested? Do you like to be tested? Well, some people do because they're competitive, but some people don't. So why are we testing students? Why are we testing teachers? What's the point? The next um, article that you might be interested in taking a look at is authoritative teaching. What is authoritative teaching? Because this is really important. If you're a teacher, do you manage class behavior? I never had problems in the classroom. And my students are not passive. <laughs> Okay, um, but classroom management, like uh, Ken Robinson said, teaching is an art, and that's part of the management. So you might want to be able to manage your students so that they perform. But what about teacher-student relationship? As I told you with my art teacher, she was very, very strict. But she also had a caring and warmth to her. She wasn't all control. She was also a very, very warm person. Uh, Erza Vag has a study, conducted a study in 2011 called Measuring Authoritative Teaching. It's also in Teaching and Teacher Education. This is a great journal if you're interested. And of course, a future study may be comparing parent teaching to teacher behavior. What do you prefer? The way your parents raised you? Or the way your teachers behaved with you? And sometimes there is a correlation. Students expect their teachers to manage them the way their parents do or don't. Okay, so there's also the influence of um, parents. And the third here is the third research study. 
this is Bill Gates um, feedback is measuring teacher effectiveness now this is really really exciting you can get this online okay there it is it's by the Institute of Education Sciences and it's by a few authors one of them you might know Darling Hammond Linda it's learning from recent advances in measuring teacher effectiveness and you might want to there's the link when you view the recording you'll be able to click on this and go straight to the article criteria what is our criteria when we think about measuring teachers well some of you mentioned accountability who is accountable for student learning is it the teachers the students the parents the school what are the consequences of how I behave with my students what about other teachers is it only me or is it a combination of teachers what about school leadership or lack of leadership what if the school administrator is making a mess of the school doesn't that influence my performance or the students performance what about innovations methods of teaching and technology are they being used what about one size fits all approach which was also mentioned is it possible to have one size teacher that fits all the one size students and then there are different classes, different school populations. Every class I taught in the uh, 36 years that I've been teaching were different. So I had to be different in each class. My behavior was completely different. Teacher development programs, are they effective? What programs have you taken? And then test taking skills. Are you good at taking tests? Give me a thumbs up if you're good at taking tests. Well, I'd say I'm pretty good because I've had a lot of experience. But test taking skills, when do we use this after school? But this is what Bill Gates is talking about. He's talking about test taking skills, the skill to take standardized testing and to raise the scores but it's only in school once you finish school you never have to do a test like this again these are things to think about but the most important thing as far as I'm concerned and the reason why I still love the art of teaching is that enthusiasm is the heart at the heart of it all nothing great was ever achieved without enthusiasm as Wald Emerson said so I encourage you to stay enthused enjoy teaching and if you haven't started teaching teach because teaching is a great way to learn as I said at the beginning it's a great way to learn Let's see if I can get that. There it is. I teach to learn. And I'm always learning to teach. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for joining us. 